Hello, welcome to the APO Productivity Talk. This is Ted Young from the Asian Productivity Organization, the APO. We are broadcasting from Tokyo, Japan, and I wish you a very good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are in the world at this moment. The APO is an international organization supporting sustainable socioeconomic development of Asia and the Pacific by promoting inclusive and innovation-led productivity growth. One of our focuses is industrial development, especially the upgrading and development of small and medium-sized enterprises in our member countries, which have been significantly affected by COVID-19 because of the restrictions on human and product movements. The disruptions in supply chains and traditional business models also paint a different picture for the global value chain. Therefore, we hope to understand how SMEs are affected during this pandemic time and how they can respond and strengthen their participation in the global value chain in the post-pandemic recovery time. Today, we invite you to join our discussion with Dr. Chandra Mugon Dengavalu, Vice President and Professor, Jeffrey Chet Institute on Southeast Asia, Sangwei University, Malaysia. Chandra is a senior economist specializing in productivity growth, trade, human capital, and macroeconomic policies in ASEAN countries. He has extensive experiences in the academia, including holding research and administrative roles in universities in Australia, Malaysia, Singapore, and the UK. He also works closely with think tanks and international organizations such as the APO, the ADBI, ASEAN, AREA, and the UNDP. In addition to his extensive publication, research, and academic editorial work. Today, we are very happy to have him to share with us his observations on the challenges faced by SMEs and the strategies that can support SMEs in the recovery time. He will examine the roles of SMEs in the global value chain and how it has been impacted by COVID-19. He will also discuss the influence of digitalization and automation in post-pandemic recovery and policy implications for human capital SME resilience and productivity. Hi, Chandra. Welcome to the APO Productivity Talk. Would you like to say hi to our audience and introduce yourself and the topic you would like to share today? Hi, Ted. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for uh, APO to invite me. And I'm very happy and delighted to talk on the uh, SME productivity and connecting to global value chain. Uh, I'm a professor at uh, Sunway University, Jeffrey Institute on Southeast Asia, and I'm also uh, 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 have an appointment at uh, Institute for International Trade uh, at the University of Adelaide. Uh, I will try to cover key issues, uh, giving uh, uh, to more contemporary issues like the COVID-19 pandemic and the role of SMEs and uh, what are the uh, various strategies the uh, policymakers can adopt and what are the various strategies uh, SMEs can adopt uh, in terms of the changing landscape that is driven by the current pandemic uh, shock. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much, Chandra, for joining us today. I can't wait to uh, listen to your observations and insights. Uh, so in the next uh, 30 minutes to 40 minutes, we will have Chandra to uh, present his uh, observations and uh, suggestions and we will take another 20 minutes or so for uh, questions and answers and discussions. And here I also hope to encourage our audience to leave your questions in the comment area, uh, noting your name, your country and your questions. So we'll get back to you uh, after this talk. Okay, thank you very much. So now I hope to uh, invite Chandra to share with us uh, his presentation uh, and his observations. Thank you, Chandra. The floor is yours now. Thank you, uh, uh, Ted. Uh, OK, uh, let me uh, start my uh, presentation. Uh, uh, the key uh, components are the SMEs and how to connect to global value chain, uh, given the current uh, pandemic shock. Uh, OK, let me uh, uh, start with the current issues. Uh, the current issues are the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. It's a very devastating impact of COVID-19 pandemic uh, due to the lockdowns, uh, restrictions, and uh, border closures. Uh, again, as of 25 uh, June uh, 2021, uh, 
nearly 180 million cases uh, and nearly 4 million deaths uh, that we already experienced. Very devastating impact. And a uh, few countries have, have escaped it. Uh, in fact, all countries are globally affected by this. And heavy disruptions, uh, disruptions to trade and investment and movement of people. And, uh, and uh, there are some expectation of the disruption to the global value chain and uh, global value chain and network itself. Uh, expectation means uh, uh, there might be some disruptions and we are still trying to figure the uh, impact itself. Okay, uh, quickly to put everything in context, uh, these are the, uh, the pandemic curves. And uh, of course, uh, for US, the, the pandemic curve uh, is been uh, flattened quite a bit, but we still see uh, the pandemic is spreading in uh, developing countries. And that is a big concern that uh, this COVID-19, the new variant called the Delta variant, uh, might be more uh, viral and uh, affect uh, countries uh, in the developing uh, uh, part of the world. Okay, uh, some key observations um, and uh, every shock, there's a transmission mechanism. For example, in the Asian financial crisis, the transmission mechanism was through the financial market and the banks. And uh, basically we use the market mechanism uh, to correct the balance sheet and clean up the balance sheet and make the banks and the uh, businesses uh, 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 more viable. And we nationalized the debt and uh, be able to bring back the economy back into uh, uh, a V-shaped recovery. And the same thing we observe in the global financial crisis, we understood how the shadow banking were working. And, and again, the transmission mechanism was through the banks and uh, we put in the right mechanism and reinforce a mechanism that was put in uh, in the Asian financial crisis. And uh, we also have experienced the tsunami. Uh, I will try to make some references to this and try to put the context of this uh, COVID-19 uh, in the context of uh, the transmission mechanism itself. Uh, the transmission mechanism of this uh, pandemic or COVID-19 uh, is through movement of people. And uh, we have experienced uh, uh, the movement of people issue before in terms of SARS and MERS, uh, but uh, as opposed to SARS and MERS, the, uh, the ability to identify uh, this virus uh, um, uh, much more weaker in COVID-19 as compared to SARS and MERS uh, because you can uh, isolate the symptoms uh, through fever. So basically what we did was we uh, put in the cameras, the thermal cameras at all the entry points and able to isolate uh, the movement of people issue and uh, able to uh, uh, keep uh, the economic activity um, intact. But the thing with, uh, other than movement of people issue uh, with uh, COVID-19, uh, it is also very highly contagious and also asymptomatic. So asymptomatic means uh, that uh, individuals can move across the border and they can carry the virus, but we might not see the symptoms uh, 14 to 21 days or even later, which means that the individual actually uh, uh, cross the border and in the community to spread the virus. And the person is not going to show any sim symptoms and only later part is going to show the symptoms. So that is the transmission mechanism of this virus. Uh, it moves through people and it's also asymptomatic. And the other component of this uh, virus, it also affects the movement of goods through the movement of people issue. So uh, the, uh, it affects the service linkages and the movement of people. Uh, these two components, service linkages and movement of people, are key fundamentals of how we drive our global value chain, our global network, both from the supply side and the demand side. So if the movement of people and uh, service linkages, the links services to manufacturing and manufacturing to services are disrupted, then the global value chain uh, disruption become more severe. And uh, that is where uh, the key issue of how uh, the value chain uh, disruptions actually occurring through uh, this COVID-19 pandemic. If you can manage the movement of people uh, and particularly in terms of uh, technology, uh, then um, 
the resilience of the value chain becomes stronger. So there are two aspects to this uh, uh, in terms of the value chain. One aspect is the uh, uh, movement of people industries and labor inten intensive industries are heavily centered uh, on this movement of people issue and heavily centered by the COVID-19. And there are also industries that are uh, able to uh, uh, move to virtual movement of people and uh, that industries are able to uh, survive and uh, move faster uh, into the space of technology, automation, and uh, digitalization. And particularly the movement of goods, uh, we are using a lot of technologies uh, to maintain the service linkages and uh, reduce the movement of people. But there are also industries that are heavily dependent on the movement of people industries, like tourism, aviation, logistic, and also uh, hotels and restaurants are heavily dependent on uh, movement of people industry. And also there are labor intensive industries within the production value chain that are heavily affected by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, the labor intensive industries are more centered at uh, developing countries rather than uh, developing countries. And uh, we will discuss some of these uh, issues in terms of acceleration and deceleration of uh, uh, technology. And uh, we also will discuss offshoring and reshoring issues that are emerging uh, faster through digitalization and automation that opens up opportunities for SMEs, uh, but also uh, uh, impose challenges uh, for some SMEs. The other characteristics of this pandemic is very asymmetric. Uh, given that uh, uh, movement of people industries and uh, uh, labor intensive industries are affected, uh, that's where most SMEs are centered uh, in terms of service sector. And uh, that's where more uh, vulnerable population are centered in terms of unskilled workers, uh, semi-skilled workers, and uh, heavily affects the middle income itself. The pandemic shock is also uh, very asymmetric uh, within a country and across countries. Uh, for example, uh, the uh, urban centers that are uh, high density are affected, but urban centers also have the uh, technology, the health infrastructure to actually protect themselves much more better than the rural sectors. So uh, the pandemic is very uneven uh, within uh, uh, a country and uh, you can see the examples of developing countries like Brazil, uh, Peru, India, and even uh, African countries uh, have a heavy uh, share of uh, rural sectors uh, that are becoming more vulnerable and they do not have enough resources to protect themselves. Which goes back to the issue of countries, countries that have uh, more resources like country like Singapore and have uh, less uh, entry points uh, uh, for example, uh, Singapore has two causeways and uh, 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 one uh, of five airports, but all the five airports are, are very much uh, controlled. The same thing with Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, these are island countries that have, uh, can control the entry points uh, of movement of people. So countries that have uh, less entry points are able to manage this and countries that have uh, shared the borders, uh, like ASEAN LDCs, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, or Vietnam, uh, they have uh, 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 more borders, more entry points to share, so their resources become much more thinner in how to manage the movement of people issue. And that leads to uh, the uh, first cycle, the second cycle, and the third cycle of the pandemic uh, effects. And uh, again, uh, vulnerability is getting higher uh, at border towns uh, because of this movement of people issue. And uh, landlocked countries like La Laos, uh, Mongolia, uh, landlocked countries are becoming uh, more exposed to the virus itself. Uh, the other issue that uh, arises as a consequence of uh, this pandemic is uh, food security and food supply chain, uh, which are becoming very important for uh, uh, developing countries as well as developed countries. Uh, although there are challenges here uh, in terms of food supply chain, but there are also opportunities for SMEs to uh, enter this market and develop uh, 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 stronger supply chain activities 
uh, due to the COVID itself, using technologies, uh, using reducing the coordination problem, uh, and adopting uh, the bubble uh, uh, framework uh, to move uh, goods between people itself. Okay, uh, and then uh, let me uh, discuss a little bit on uh, 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 the type of shock we are experiencing and I relate this to, to the global value chain. And I discussed a little bit uh, broadly on uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Asian financial crisis and uh, global financial crisis. And uh, because it's very regional focus and uh, we had uh, V-shaped recovery. And we also had uh, uh, shocks like the growth, uh, Great uh, East uh, Japan uh, 2011 earthquake, 2004 tsunami uh, that uh, uh, has a devastating impact on uh, infrastructure itself. Uh, but the pandemic uh, uh, is a little bit different uh, in the sense that uh, uh, the, the infrastructure is not uh, destroyed. Uh, the factories are still there. The infrastructure is still there. And uh, uh, the technologies are still there. Uh, the issue is the movement of people. And that is the key characteristics of this pandemic. Uh, if, if policymakers can solve the movement of people issue, uh, then uh, we were able to move, uh, get closer to the, uh, the new normal uh, that uh, we have uh, defined in terms of recovery process itself. So the movement of people itself is affecting how we can uh, 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 restart our factories and restart our, of, of, uh, our global value chain itself. Uh, and of course, we are restarting the factories through uh, uh, the bubble structure, the bubble framework, and uh, whether it is the uh, travel corridor of uh, uh, try, trying to bubble our uh, export processing zones, uh, these are all options and policies that are emerging uh, uh, quite uh, clearly in terms of the recovery process itself. And of course, given our uh, production uh, supply chains are, uh, are still intact in terms of the uh, infrastructure, uh, then the question is how to restart that. Uh, so fairly, we have identified uh, the resilience of the value chain uh, from the supply side, uh, but uh, we are still not sure the resilience of the value chain from the demand side. Uh, we believe there will be a collapse of the uh, demand side of the value chain. Okay, so how are we going to have the uh, V-shape recovery or the U-shape or the K-shape recovery or the L-shape? It uh, depends on two issues. One, how we can resolve the movement of people issue. And the second is uh, how uh, uh, viral or, uh, or persistent uh, this um, uh, COVID-19 variant will be. And uh, increasingly, the, the, the virus is becoming more persistent, uh, especially the Delta variant, which means that uh, the persistent creates uh, a lot of issues for businesses uh, because uh, the persistent means uh, uh, the, uh, the production cost increases over time uh, uh, when factories are still there, but the movement of people issue is not being resolved. So uh, the, it's a priority that we need to think of how to resolve uh, the movement of people issue uh, and then uh, also manage the uh, COVID-19, the new variant itself. Okay, uh, again, uh, let me talk a little bit about um, why uh, we are having difficulty in uh, managing uh, 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 pandemic policy or the public policy itself in man managing the shock. Uh, as opposed to the previous uh, uh, shock from SARS and MERS, fairly be able to isolate uh, the, uh, the, the, the cases and uh, we still kept the market economy intact. Uh, this pandemic uh, has created a different issue for us that clearly uh, identified the public uh, choices issue versus the private sector choice. And in most cases, private sector uh, will not internalize uh, or the market will not internalize uh, public good choices in the decision making process. Uh, so uh, the way we design our our, uh, our our public policy 
uh, is to use market mechanism to correct uh, uh, or incentivize businesses and use the uh, incentive like uh, uh, corporate tax, uh, direct indirect tax uh, as part of the fiscal uh, status uh, to support uh, public goods, uh, education, health, uh, security, and uh, also uh, maintaining uh, public infrastructure itself. So uh, in this case, the, uh, the pandemic has completely paralyzed the market. So we can't use the market mechanism to solve our pandemic issue. So we need to solve the pandemic issues uh, uh, independently uh, from the uh, market-based uh, issues. Unless we solve the, uh, the pandemic by itself, it will be very difficult to use the market mechanism uh, to solve, which leads to the issue of policy coordination so the private sector uh, 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 and public sector have to coordinate this uh, to solve uh, the, um, the public choice and the private choice additions itself, as opposed to the previous shocks that we have experienced. So when, uh, when private sector don't participate uh, in the public choices, then uh, the uh, public goods and public choices will be more inward looking uh, for example, uh, since uh, the COVID-19 is asymptomatic and we cannot observe uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cases in terms of movement of people against uh, people who are not affected. So there are a lot of unobservables. Uh, policymakers' choice of not able to identify the, 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 the virus leads to a high level of regulation. So high level of regulation means that a lot of unobservables and, and means uh, the policy of uh, uh, closing the border uh, becomes a strong option. So isolation, containment, uh, mitigation early to reduce human casualties are very important in uh, managing the pandemic, uh, which means that since there are a lot of unobservables and we don't have information to design our public policy, require strong border and lockdown policies. So social distancing, social isolation, and uh, quarantines, stay home orders, and also wearing masks become uh, uh, important uh, uh, public choice uh, policies itself. And uh, this means that public sector, private sector uh, need to come in and create a new dimension in what we call the new normal of public policy which means the public-private partnership will be very important. Uh, private sector need to protect uh, its investment and public sector need to protect uh, its welfare and uh, its uh, uh, public goods. And that it leads to an important overlap and uh, this cannot be done uh, 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 independently from each other. So uh, the way uh, the policies have been developed uh, still uh, in isolation from the public sector. So uh, private sector, uh, large multinationals uh, need to heavily participate uh, in how we're going to develop the public choices itself. Okay, so again, uh, this is important for us in terms of how the recovery will be, uh, setting up a stage to discuss um, the opportunities for SMEs. As you can see uh, from uh, di the diagram itself, uh, uh, that uh, the, uh, the Asian financial crisis, we have one blip uh, and then the uh, rest of the world was recovering. So uh, we recovered the V-shape. And then in the global financial crisis, uh, the, uh, the rest of the world went into some uh, uh, recession, but uh, uh, East Asia and Asia was able to maintain and uh, given our global value chain, uh, the framework, we able to recover uh, in a V-shape. The COVID-19, as you can see, has two blips, uh, one uh, given by the, uh, the yellow and the blue, which shows that there is persistent in the shock. And the persistent is not just uh, 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 East Asia and uh, the rest of the world. Uh, fairly, we, going, we hope, uh, that uh, we will have a stronger recovery itself. So there's a projection that comes from World Bank, IMF, uh, ADB, that uh, we will have a V-shaped recovery. And uh, of course, the recovery is very likely to be driven by uh, China. 
And as you can see, China is the only uh, country that are uh, uh, able to maintain uh, positive growth even uh, during the uh, pandemic itself. And uh, this shows uh, 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 how the value chain uh, will be affected. Uh, both uh, demand side and supply side will be affected. And, uh, and we, uh, the demand has dropped significantly because of uh, social distancing and business disruption. And uh, if this recovery is very temporary, uh, that's what we initially thought, uh, then uh, we will have a faster V-shaped recovery. Uh, but uh, the persistence itself uh, means that uh, people uh, cannot go back to work. Uh, business disruptions are severe and means that uh, as long as the uh, COVID-19 variant is persistent, uh, businesses uh, are, are going to take longer to start. Uh, it's already been a year and a half, and we think that uh, uh, there will be a recovery. Uh, the issue will be uh, what type of recovery uh, we like to see. So uh, the, again, uh, service sector is disrupted uh, because of the movement of people, uh, industries and labor intensive industries. Key industries are affected are tourism, finance, hotel, restaurants, business and aviation uh, industries. And the aviation industries has been transforming uh, quite significantly uh, in the pre-COVID. For example, uh, A380s, uh, the Airbus, the, uh, the, the whole uh, framework of uh, large planes is to move large uh, movement of people that support uh, this movement of people industries. And again, uh, these industries is where uh, SMEs are, and these are industries where uh, most vulnerable population are centered. So uh, these industries are going to take longer to recover uh, because of the movement of people issue that will take longer to resolve. Uh, and the, uh, the current state uh, is still unable to identify and isolate the unobservables, especially the symptomatic cases, which directly affects uh, the service activities linked to the movement of people issue, uh, which means that uh, the persistence of the shock will affect the persistence of these industries. And uh, there is some concern that um, the uh, unemployment that we want to see are uh, likely to be uh, not just cyclical unemployment. Uh, we might be moving uh, very much to structural unemployment. Uh, there's a clear definition of what is a cyclical unemployment. Uh, cyclical unemployment means that there are jobs uh, and just use uh, demand-driven uh, fiscal policies, huge amount of uh, fiscal relief and fiscal stimulus packages will drive demand and demand will capture all the supply itself. So uh, that is what uh, the new Keynesian or Keynesian uh, framework of uh, inducing demand side. But if there are structural issues, then uh, we might be creating a lot of jobs, uh, creating jobs, but our workers might not have the right skills to pick up that jobs. Then they are structurally unemployed because of the mismatch issue. And that is more serious and have a long-term implication in terms of recovery itself. And uh, which has, uh, uh, important implication for social policy and social protection itself. Okay, so again, uh, this diagram comes from uh, uh, Asian uh, uh, Development Bank uh, and clearly shows uh, that uh, the collapse of the movement of people in industries such like tourism and the right hand side shows you the, uh, uh, the, the time it takes to recover. The longer it takes to recover, more persistent the, sh the shock is, uh, very likely we're going to see a structural uh, impact and there will structural transformation in these industries. Again, uh, in terms of uh, uh, employment, uh, you can see how the, uh, the impact uh, will be. Uh, so there's a collapse in the labor market uh, and in terms of unemployment in most countries, uh, it's not just the un uh, employment and unemployment issue. Uh, the wages also have collapsed. So the key issue in the post-pandemic recovery is the uh, recovery of jobs and also recovery of wages. And uh, these two issues will be very important and significant for us, uh, which basically means that uh, based on previous shocks, uh, 
the vulnerable population will find it uh, difficult to retain uh, themselves in the labor market. And the vulnerable population like the youth, uh, uh, females, uh, older workers, unskilled uh, workers uh, will find it difficult to even recover their wages itself uh, for a longer period of time, which means that we need more social protection to protect the vulnerable people. And the, the other issue that's going to be important uh, is training and retooling our workers. And again, uh, this will be very critical and countries will be spending a lot of resources on training and retooling our workers, which basically means that uh, uh, there are opportunities for uh, SMEs uh, to participate uh, as training providers and SMEs to participate in providing uh, training opportunities uh, for a large uh, segment of the labor market. And uh, in terms of uh, social implications, uh, social implications are also uh, great. Unemployment are becoming uh, very cyclical in nature. So the recovery we are projecting uh, very likely will be uh, a jobless recovery. Uh, if it's going to be a jobless recovery, then uh, we will have issues in terms of um, uh, how to bring back the uh, workers, how to recover the jobs, and what, uh, what type of jobs we come to recover. So uh, very likely poverty will increase, and uh, World Bank has uh, forecasted that uh, the amount of poverty reduction uh, in pre-COVID uh, will be uh, completely wiped out, and more people will be in poverty in the post-pandemic recovery. And greater number of people will be moving from formal sectors to informal sectors, uh, which would uh, directly affect the productivity of workers and productivity of SMEs and uh, generally the productivity of overall uh, uh, industries itself. And uh, in terms of uh, human capital, uh, which is very fundamental for productivity improvement, uh, there are educational disruptions uh, uh, for youth, and which means that uh, youth will take longer to complete their education and also uh, 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 education has moved uh, very strongly into online uh, virtual learning. Not many uh, youth are able to participate uh, in a virtual learning environment, uh, given they lack the resources, given the lack of infrastructure to support them, which means that, that the vulnerability of uh, developing countries in terms of human capital development uh, will be an important issue for us to discuss. So uh, training uh, uh, is offered, uh, but training is only to those who are in the labor market itself. So significant proportion of the training will be, di will be required to divert at um, formal, informal markets, unemployed uh, youth. Uh, these are the key issues that uh, we need to address. Um, so the first impact of our stimulus package in terms of training will be directed at those already in the labor market and able to retain the labor market. But the pandemic has uh, shown us that large segment of the uh, people are either looking for a job as an employed, or already moved to the informal sector, temporary employment. So we need to bring them back into the labor market. Uh, that will be a very important challenge for us. Uh, and this shows the, uh, the comes from the World Bank and clearly shows the, uh, uh, the pre-pandemic uh, uh, poverty reduction is completely wiped out by the yellow component where the poverty has increased. Sectors that we're going to see a lot of poverty, uh, movement of people industries and the labor intensive industries uh, where this COVID is highly centered. At. And uh, I, let me talk now on the GVCs, uh, services, and SMEs. And uh, uh, in terms of, uh, this is how we see uh, the global value chain itself. The global value chain uh, has production uh, nodes uh, that's given by the bubbles and the service linkages that are given by the lines. And uh, production uh, bubbles are given by blue. The blue are the, the biggest, uh, markets, the supply and the demand markets that ex exist in the production value chain. 
and the uh, the green ones are the uh, production centers that support the blue and uh, the both the demand side and the supply side the green uh, uh, production nodes are also linked by themselves uh, through the lines uh, through the service linkages so service linkages are important to move goods uh, between the production uh, uh, nodes and uh, also to the demand nodes that is germany us and uh, china and uh, the uh, uh, the more complex network that is created by the uh, the lines and the nodes uh, more uh, resilient the value chain will be that means both uh, within industry between industry ac activities are stronger and the service linkages are very fundamental for us uh, in terms of uh, moving goods um, meeting uh, demand and also using technology uh, to drive the service linkages and the uh, the complex network itself the key issue with the pandemic is uh, i already mentioned the movement of people uh, that means within each production uh, nodes there are disruptions particularly those nodes that are more uh, labor intensive uh, activities are taking place uh, at the same time, the movement of goods uh, through the lines, the service linkages, uh, has technology intensive and also labor intensive uh, activities. So we can divide uh, the services from modern services like professional services, uh, financial services, telecommunication services that have uh, the digital component are uh, able to keep uh, the service linkages intact in the production uh, value chain itself. On the other hand, uh, traditional services, uh, for example, tourism, aviation industries, logistic industries that are very much uh, uh, heavily centered on movement of people industry, are uh, heavily disrupted by uh, the COVID itself. And uh, this is a very famous uh, uh, smiling face of the value chain. And this is taking uh, what we see earlier uh, in terms of the, uh, 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 the multi-dimensional input output table. And then uh, looking at all the production nodes. Uh, here, it slice this cake, uh, this uh, 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 complex network in the center. And you will see uh, this design. This design is interesting. On the uh, left hand side is the production uh, 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 value chain. On the right hand side is the demand side of the value chain. And uh, you can identify uh, uh, high end R&D design purchasing are uh, all centered at the developing countries. And the production uh, 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 centered very much at developing countries, especially in Asia, Asia countries like um, uh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, uh, even uh, India, Pakistan, uh, Bangladesh, countries and Sri Lanka participating uh, in the production side. Uh, in uh, countries that I mentioned, also participating in labor intensive activities, for example, clothing and garment industries itself. So we expect uh, R&D design purchasing to be very digitalized and automation will take over uh, quite a bit of those activities and developing countries are able to uh, transit to those activities much more faster because they have a higher human capital. And then the production side will collapse or, or, or flatten. Uh, with, uh, labor intensive production uh, will uh, move into more automation and also more into digitalization and no industries was bad, including clothing and garment, where artificial intelligence or robotics might uh, affect the production itself, uh, which directly affects a lot of SMEs uh, in the production. On the right-hand side is the distribution side. Uh, the distribution uh, side will collapse uh, because uh, the digital part uh, has accelerated significantly from the COVID itself. In the pre-COVID, uh, we observe uh, acceleration of technology, the smartphones, with telecommunication uh, 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 technologies, uh, the distribution side, uh, marketing and services, and consumer-to-consumer uh, -consumer communication and uh, uh, was accelerated. With the post-pandemic, uh, uh, the acceleration uh, has intensified uh, with 
5G smart activities and digitalization will accelerate the distribution of channels and the warehousing uh, channels will, uh, will, uh, uh, will restructure the logistic part will restructure digitalization and the marketing structure again uh, how to reach out consumers uh, and the consumers affecting businesses uh, that part will also collapse. So the demand side, the right hand side, where most of the SMEs are, uh, will go through significant transformation through digitalization and automation. So uh, again, uh, impact of uh, COVID uh, and digital economy uh, increases connectivity uh, and it reduces entry costs of firms. Uh, and that is the, the important part of digital economy itself. And when you reduce entry costs, uh, SMEs that can participate in this uh, need technology and, uh, and understanding of technology and uh, social entrepreneurs and digital entrepreneurs uh, uh, will participate in this. And those are skilled and those with human capital are able to absorb technology are able to participate in this. So the ample opportunities for SMEs to participate and transform in this acceleration. But at the same time, I already mentioned uh, the supply curve of flatten. Uh, and uh, although our factories uh, activities are there, uh, we still need to solve the movement of people uh, issue. So the movement of people issue uh, uh, might be uh, managed through the bubble uh, structure framework, where we might bubble uh, export processing zones putting in the movement of people protocol for businesses, for small businesses to start, that adds an extra cost for businesses. And uh, again, uh, uh, we can restart some part of the value chain, but still uh, movement of people, labor intensive activities are heavily centered uh, in uh, less developed countries. So the less developed countries are likely to face uh, more issues, uh, more uh, framework to manage the movement of people policies and movement of people industries. And uh, again, uh, when we move to digital economy, uh, information will be very critical in, in, uh, in information infrastructure and telecommunication infrastructure will be very critical, which means that uh, our SMEs uh, will be able to participate uh, in this, if we put up the right regulation and framework, again, uh, the vulnerability of developing countries and less developed countries uh, to actually participate in this, given their lack of infrastructure and human capital will be quite uh, significant. And within developed countries and uh, emerging countries, uh, there will be uh, creative destruction in jobs and creative destruction in social activities, uh, particularly the demand side. And uh, uh, we hope there will be more creation than destruction. But at the moment, uh, we think there will be more destruction for developing countries than creation. And uh, for, for them to participate in creative industries, on industries that are emerging industries, they need a strong uh, infrastructure and human capital to participate in this. So we need more flexible uh, labor market, uh, more flexible uh, institution, more flexible human capital. They're able to participate in different uh, skills as different tasks. And we're going to move from uh, uh, skills to tasks. And domestic capacity of SMEs will be very critical for us. So institution to respond to new age activities, uh, more forward-looking activities, that will be very critical. Human capital must be able to participate in uh, participating in different tasks. Uh, that will also be very critical for us as we move uh, 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 in this. So SMEs must be more forward-looking, uh, must be uh, able to participate in, in skills, tasks, and innovative activities. Okay, so quickly, uh, what is this disruption we are discussing? Uh, this, the disruption has two elements. Uh, and uh, telecommunication technology uh, are not very even. So information uh, technology uh, that will intensify uh, with digitalization, like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, automation, robotics, or Industry 4.0 that encompasses this, is likely to reduce the number of tasks 
and generate uh, uh, concentration forces. So what do we mean by agglomeration forces? The agglomeration is dri uh, driven by machine to machine communication and more uh, machine to machine communication activities will intensify. A good example of machine to machine activities are your iPhone to iPhone communication increases. So machine to machine, uh, iPad to iPad, uh, and uh, those activities will intensify significantly in the production and also at the demand side, uh, also in the households. So the communication technology, uh, on the other hand, uh, will create uh, dispersion forces that allow us to communicate and link to the far part of the world. Uh, for example, I'm now in Singapore, I'm uh, teaching uh, in, in KL and also participating in Australia and also participating in this uh, uh, presentation in Tokyo. So again, uh, allow me to connect uh, and disperse my activities and do multiple acti activities at the same time. So uh, policymakers will face both agglomeration effects the concentration forces, uh, and at the same time, the dis dispersion effects are within the country and between regions uh, will intensify uh, in the uh, digitalized and automation itself. So, which basically means that um, concentration forces are important for medium to long term growth for develop and developing countries. Uh, that's where the key fundamentals are, where we can create a lot of. Uh, and knowledge base or what we call endogenous growth itself. So we need strong SMEs, strong human capital, and we're going to see an acceleration of modern services through digitalization. So modern services already mentioned before, uh, knowledge-based services, professional services, uh, telecommunication services, and uh, financial services. And within logistic, uh, there will be a transformation to uh, digitalization, automation, and uh, those logistic services are still on labor movement and labor intensive will, uh, will get uh, marginalized or will get thinner uh, as we more uh, participate in digital activities. So there will be a deceleration of traditional services and traditional trade, uh, services trade, uh, tourism, uh, will uh, uh, and, and hotels, restaurants will have to realign to the new normal and uh, industries that uh, depend on a uh, large movement of people industries uh, will be greatly affected. And the last question is, uh, we will see heavy agglomeration in services. Services will carry a lot of new technologies and intensify technologies and these technologies we will, will see in developing countries. For example, Food Panda, Gojax, uh, we're going to see a lot of these kind of activities in developed and developing countries and even in less developed countries. Okay, so uh, policies need to balance agglomeration and dispersion forces. Human capital will be very critical, uh, education and training and re retooling and tooling our workers are very important, which means the private sector need heavily to participate uh, in this future skills and the future activities are workers uh, and uh, we need more forward-looking policies uh, in uh, uh, human capital itself. Uh, we need to liberalize our services and, uh, and participate in more trade. Inward-looking policies is not going to drive um, uh, most uh, developing and less developed countries. Uh, new HFTAs and uh, FTAs like RCEP uh, provides the framework uh, to balance localization versus globalization, uh, balance e-commerce, also balance a movement of people issue, virtual migration, and also allows us to create uh, virtual SMEs uh, space uh, for SMEs to participate uh, in this uh, virtual space. So there are free trade agreements that allow this and we need to use uh, more of this free trade agreement for regional cooperation and also uh, uh, to allow and bring private sector to participate in this regional integration itself. And uh, quickly, uh, and how we're going to manage these uh, policies need to be designed 
and most of our urban centers will be very critical because that's where most of our investments are centered on for both developed and developing countries. So we need to protect and uh, manage our uh, urban centers and also balance this with our rural centers. So uh, the bubbling the urban centers, bubbling the cities, and uh, managing a movement of people uh, national at the sub-national level uh, will be very critical for us. And that movement of people will allow us to manage uh, our uh, cities and the city to city connectivity can be improved. And the city to city connectivity will be very critical for us to move into the digital economy, automation economy, and also to capture some of the modern services itself. Uh, that dimension is very important for developing countries and also uh, uh, ASEAN LDCs, Cambodia, Laos, and Myanmar, how they're going to manage uh, the uh, development of cities and the medium and uh, uh, larger cities are equally important and movement of people between cities, movement of people between uh, zones, economic zones, and bubbling economic zones will be very important uh, as part of uh, managing the movement of people and uh, reducing uh, the, uh, the, uh, the symptomatic nature of the COVID transmission itself. And that is very important uh, for us, how we're going to use urban uh, centers uh, to move our economy uh, to uh, digitalization and automation. At the same time, uh, managing the dispersion forces of uh, labor intensive activities uh, in our smaller cities and, uh, uh, and uh, medium sized cities. So, services productivity and uh, GVC will be very critical uh, as uh, service activities intensify and uh, institutional reforms and facilitating, facilitating SMEs and entrepreneurship uh, will be very critical for us. Entrepreneurship is very critical because this is where uh, opportunities arise. So although the COVID has created disruption, the COVID also has created ample opportunities for us to get and uh, move our economy to a higher stage of value added activities. So SME policy is key for sustainable development. At this stage, SME policies and strategies will be very critical how to move our SMEs into this space and how to retain our SMEs uh, in labor intensive and movement of people industries are equally important. And uh, how to intensify the human capital dimension. So service linkages are important, modern technology uh, disruption and uh, manage the technology disruption and participating the value chain will be very important. And uh, we need uh, innovative and uh, multinational SMEs and SMEs are internationalized, uh, multinationals are uh, uh, SMEs that cross the border uh, can be uh, uh, defined as SMEs that participate in multinational activities in different set of activities, both home and uh, overseas itself. In new trade growth, uh, mean, which means that we must increase the SME participation and internationalization of SMEs. SMEs policy will be very crucial for us uh, for inclusive growth, uh, for poverty reduction, uh, managing digital divide, particularly the micro enterprise will be very critical for us to manage this and also to managing uh, the widening wage gap and skill gap that we're going to experience uh, in the post pandemic recovery, particularly the financial inclusion of SMEs are very going to be very critical and uh, increasing the uh, SMEs in the GVC and using free trade agreements such as RCEP, um, Regional Cooperative Economic Partnership, by the 15 countries, 10 ASEAN countries, and five uh, East Asian countries, like Japan, uh, China, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, are going to be very critical uh, in the post-pandemic recovery and also for the ASEAN uh, SMEs and East Asian SMEs, uh, given that uh, they have a strong focus on the GVC activities and the movement of people and uh, on the services, professional services, uh, uh, liberalization, and they also have an SME uh, chapter. Uh, 
that's what I have. Uh, Ted, uh, thank you. And I'm now uh, open for questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Chandra. Thank you very much. Uh, it, it, it's really impressive how you managed to uh, untangle uh, all these issues in one presentation. I really appreciate that. It's it's really comprehensive. Uh, I think I, I think you managed to uh, bring out a lot of different uh, aspects that COVID has been impacting and how we need to how we can uh, uh, respond. Uh, I think you started with identifying the issue being uh, the restriction on the movement of people, and you also break it down uh, the I mean the impacts on different layers, different aspects. Uh, including on uh, the global value chain and on uh, social and economic uh, issues. And it's also very important that you mention uh, how digitalization and technologies are affecting or are participating in, this, uh, in this, all these changes and how the implications are made to uh, the service sector, informal sector, SMEs, uh, and most importantly, how human capital can be uh, or should be further developed to uh, respond to uh, this crisis in the recovery time. Uh, you also mentioned about the urban, uh, suburban issues, and also, especially uh, what I appreciate the most is that you also take the perspectives from uh, developing or emerging countries so that uh, they are not left out uh, in this uh, change or in this recovery time. And uh, this is basically what we are trying to focus on uh, in this uh, P talk, which is how to actually connect SMEs back to uh, the global value chain. So I really appreciate uh, your one for sharing. I think there are a lot of insights. Uh, each section can be an individual P talk itself, but I'm very, very grateful that uh, you managed to uh, put them together. Uh, I think we have around maybe five to 10 minutes for uh, questions. So uh, here I will just uh, raise a few questions that I have in mind uh, for for a quick short discussion. But I encourage our uh, viewers, our audience, to leave your questions in the common area so we can get back to you uh, after this P talk uh, with Chandra's suggestions and, and and feedback. Okay, so uh, since we are talking about SMEs and global value chain, um, I hope to uh, ask one question. Uh, it may be a very uh, old-fashioned or cliche question, but uh, I'll come. I'll come to the point of uh, the comparative advantages that SMEs have. So my question is that, with the advantage of uh, capital and technological capacity of uh, multinational corporations, what may be the comparative advantages that SMEs in emerging countries? can have to uh, say break into or be connected to the GVC? Uh, that, that's an that's an, uh, uh, interesting question. So uh, the key idea of the global value chain uh, is uh, uh, it's not so much on uh, technology. Uh, it's, uh, it's based on the cost and division of labor. So the way the, uh, the production value chain is been broken down is based on uh, skill, semi-skill, labor intensive, and even resource intensive activities. So when you look at from the division or labor perspective, uh, all SMEs can participate, all countries can participate uh, in, the, in the global value chain itself. Participation uh, is the first iteration but how to position yourself up the value chain is also very critical. That means the multinationals, uh, when they govern the value chain, they look at uh, various tiers and they want to make sure that uh, SMEs uh, and industries and their own firms are efficient in uh, not only production, but also movement of goods. And that is very critical. So uh, SMEs need to understand the structure of the, SM uh, the GVC for each uh, products, uh, each uh, 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 how the regional uh, uh, value chain are uh, uh, developed and assigned. And the framework is very critical for them to do their business design, which means that uh, they can participate uh, from where they are in a lot of uh, global value chain activities 
uh, through uh, digital technology and internet technology as an example. So within a country, uh, uh, they can uh, provide and supply key uh, parts and components uh, to uh, the SMEs themselves. And they must need to be uh, very efficient. Efficiency is defined uh, not just in terms of uh, production, but also in terms of how they understand and manage technology, able to maintain quality of their products and quality of the service. And this is how we define uh, efficiency itself. So there are three aspects to this. One is understanding of technologies. Two is uh, using uh, the platforms, uh, using the technology platforms and uh, able to participate uh, with, uh, in the GVC activities within and between countries. And the third one is uh, they need uh, a human capital and uh, need, they need uh, critical skills uh, to actually participate uh, in uh, and absorb and uh, position themselves higher up in the value chain. So participating is one dimension, but uh, positioning up the value chain, creating value added uh, in the value chain uh, is the critical component. Uh, participation is not value added activity. Participation is purely bringing your, your, your resources at the lowest labor cost or labor's, uh, lowest cost to, uh, to participate. Uh, positioning means uh, you're creating value in the value chain. So uh, they need they need to understand how to create value, uh, be more creative. And that is the space we are moving now in the post-pandemic, which has opened up a lot of in interesting space um, from the demand side and the supply side, uh, where uh, consumers to consumer communication is intensified. So entrepreneurship are not just based on uh, private sector. Social entrepreneurship is becoming very big and understanding social network is becoming uh, very important participation for SMEs. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andre. I think, I think your answer is wonderful. Uh, uh, it's not just about participation, but also how they actually can create values. And that is why they are part of the uh, global value chain and how to enable themselves and uh, position themselves in this whole process and in the, this global value chain, that's a, that's a more important issue that SMEs need to think about. Uh, but it also leads to uh, my other question that I think you have mentioned about uh, human capital, because during this uh, COVID pandemic time, we see that people need to scratch their heads to, to think about how they get to create value or during this lockdown, uh, situation, how they get to improve themselves to stay, say, relevant or useful in the um, value creation process in economic uh, activities. So uh, my question will be, what may, with these experiences from uh, COVID-19 and the, cha the, the changes that it has made um, to business models or to people, what are the implications for human capital development? at a macro level, uh, company level, and an individual level. For example, for government, how should they support individuals to develop human capital? Or an organization level, uh, what may be their expectation or what they can do to, uh, to help to, or what they require uh, in terms of skills? And for individuals, uh, what kind of reskilling or upskilling that they need to say pursue so that they can keep creating or contributing to the value, uh, to the global value chain? Uh, this is an uh, interesting question, uh, Ted. Uh, before I move into this, uh, quickly, uh, I just want to add something on the SMEs. Uh, interestingly, the post pandemic uh, recovery. Uh, it's not just uh, looking at uh, businesses and participating in business side or the supply side or the value chain is uh, important. Uh, this, the demand side and the social part is becoming so important for SMEs to participate. So SMEs must understand uh, the demand side is creating a lot of ample opportunities. For example, uh, food delivery, e-commerce, uh, and even in digital space itself. So uh, SMEs need to be very forward-looking. 
uh, to look uh, into the social issues and social problems themselves. And this is where the critical dimension of uh, new SMEs are going to emerge and uh, that will improve the efficiency on the, on the, on the demand side. Uh, okay, now let me get with the human capital part. Uh, there are two aspects to human capital. Uh, one is education, the other one is uh, training. So education is uh, the flow into the uh, human capital. So most of the education is centered on the youth and uh, the youth brings uh, new knowledge uh, to the labor market and they, bring, they are the one who uh, understand uh, more receptive to new technology and implement technology much more faster. Then we have those already in the labor market uh, with education and with on the job skills. So uh, those people, uh, the access to uh, formal education uh, is still lagging in most of the Asian countries or East Asian countries. That means uh, the way we have designed our labor market is most of them have to participate in the labor market to pick up whatever skills they need and whatever uh, tools they can acquire on the job. But the creative destruction and the uh, economic shocks and pandemic shock uh, has created uh, new dimensions. What, whatever skills they have in the labor market become irrelevant as uh, digitalization automation accelerate. So from business perspective, uh, the pandemic is persistent. Persistent means it's, uh, uh, it's taking longer to resolve. Uh, policy design for pandemic policy, a uh, labor movement policy uh, are, are very slow in response to the labor market, which basically means that uh, the cost of moving, uh, uh, of uh, maintaining their production on labor intensive is getting higher and higher. Uh, because of the lockdowns. So businesses will accelerate uh, their shift towards technology, to digitalization and innovation, which means that new jobs, new skills, and whatever jobs that are that, uh, destroyed, you're not going to get the same kind of jobs, which basically means uh, there will be creative destruction at the occupational level. So occupations will be redefined in terms of new skills, so whatever on the job skills you have will uh, disappear uh, pretty fast in the pandemic. So uh, the persistence of this uh, shock and the persistence of unemployment is what we call hysteresis in the labor market. That means somebody become unemployed and takes longer to find a job. Uh, the probability is going to find a job uh, become less. And uh, these are very critical issues. So uh, the hysteresis impact are more significant for older workers, even educated older workers. Uh, white collar jobs, uh, when they disappear, they don't come back in the same form. Uh, unskilled workers, uh, again, uh, we have divided the unskilled workers uh, to essential workers and those in the labor intensive industries. So fairly, uh, the essential workers are important for us to drive our essential services and essential activities. Uh, and of course, essential workers and unskilled workers are paid less. Uh, that's one aspect uh, of uh, 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 job recovery uh, process. The other aspect is the wage recovery process. Uh, both uh, we need strong participation of um, our private sector, especially in the post pandemic. So let me get back into training part and the retooling part. So the government and policymakers can spend a lot of money uh, in retooling uh, workers. And the easiest component to retool is, of course, uh, unskilled workers. Um, and um, unskilled youth uh, and educated youth, uh, we need to train them, uh, give them the new uh, digital space, uh, digital education, and more technical education to get into uh, the, 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 the occupational space the new job occupational space that we created. Uh, so we need to push them faster because they are the one who have the education. So then there's another segment of uh, older workers with education, uh, age 45 to 55, very vulnerable uh, for our labor market shocks and negative shocks. And they are the one who find very difficult um, to retain themselves in the labor market and most of them, when they get retrenched, find it very difficult to uh, get back with the labor market. 
So again, uh, how to train these older workers? Uh, they are, might be professionals, managers, and technicians at the age of 45 to 50. Uh, will be very challenging for us. Uh, this goes for uh, developing countries like Malaysia, uh, even Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, where we will see more uh, mid uh, white collar jobs, uh, mid skill skills, uh, mid level skills disappearing and might not be coming back due to digitalization itself, uh, which means uh, engineers, accountants, lawyers, and uh, secretaries, uh, secretarial jobs uh, will disappear very fast for us. Again, how to retool them to get back to the labor market will be very critical. We need plans. And uh, education and training uh, uh, takes longer uh, to uh, uh, instill in an individual. So uh, educating somebody to a degree, to a master's, take very long, uh, take at least eight years to 12 years. So, uh, which means that uh, accelerating education uh, will not uh, purely uh, will solve uh, the short run issue, but uh, very fundamental for the uh, medium to the long run. Training of the workers is very fundamental and uh, we need to train workers, but uh, uh, public sector training is not sufficient because the creative destruction in occupation is driven by businesses uh, and businesses understand the kind of jobs they want to create. So private sector must participate in training itself and uh, in vocational training and skill training. Very, very fundamental for us in the post pandemic recovery because they are the one who are deciding uh, which jobs disappear and how to restructure the occupation itself uh, in the uh, structural transformation to digitalization. So private sector must participate and uh, provide uh, incentive for individuals together, the public sector to train workers. So training workers is only one aspect, but train workers to be retained and securing a job uh, is so fundamental for us. So uh, that's where uh, the private sector need to participate to reduce the uh, resource costs and the misallocation of resources in terms of training itself. So uh, we hope that the uh, private sector will come in uh, to create and participate strongly uh, in the uh, training part in the post pandemic recovery itself. The last part is uh, workers themselves uh, must be aware of the future. Uh, that future is important and information is so fundamental for them. So workers need to invest in a portfolio of skills and portfolio of education. So they need to acquire multiple uh, uh, education. So an accountant, uh, if he can uh, have uh, economics degree, uh, uh, a doctor has in, a medical doctor has in, having an uh, MBA, uh, double degrees, uh, double uh, majors, and multiple degrees are very fundamental for us. So public sector uh, policies can be designed to bring uh, the, uh, the labor market and those already in the labor market closer to the formal education is very fundamental for us so that they can acquire uh, new degrees, new skills, even in the mid career uh, is so fundamental for us. So educational services and educational universities and educational providers will have to go through this transformation of bringing uh, uh, the education, the informal education closer to the formal education. The training must overlap significantly with the formal education itself. That will allow uh, workers to come back because uh, the problem of workers is that uh, all the professionals or mid-career workers is the cost of leaving a job uh, to go and educate themselves is very, very high, very expensive. So the private sector must work together, the public sector, to reduce this opportunity cost for uh, workers or mid career professionals to go back and acquire their skills and still come back and participate in the labor market. So we need to re redesign our, uh, our labor regulation. We need to design uh, and uh, put in new labor laws to allow uh, this uh, transition from the formal to the informal market, educational market, and back to the formal market itself. Uh, 
we need uh, very forward looking policies we need uh, a lot of resources uh, to spend in this uh, especially from uh, the government not only within the government but at the regional level uh, we also need to coordinate the movement of people and skill movement of people and skill movement of people exactly thank you chandre i think you pointed out a very very important thing that um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic doesn't just uh, create issues on public health, on economic and social issues, but it also changed the whole landscape of uh, economic ac activities, including uh, how education uh, or labor market is uh, running. So um, I think people, uh, no matter it's uh, the government or the organizations or the individuals, they need to anticipate that uh, the landscape will be different already, or uh, let's say COVID has uh, 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 make it make the change faster. So people need to be more agile in acquiring different skills to accommodate the new uh, needs or demand from the market. And it's not just uh, about the business side. Uh, there are also a lot of uh, social issues or social sector demands uh, that needs to be uh, uh, addressed. So uh, you also mentioned uh, a few times about the skills in uh, say digital technologies or uh, using technologies or uh, cross-skilling that uh, will help to uh, have our say SMEs to stay relevant and to be able to more timely create values uh, in, in this uh, economic uh, uh, new economy in a sense yeah so thank you very much for for the very very insightful sharing i think you cover a lot of different aspects that uh, i think it will be very very relevant uh, and very important for our audience because most of our audience they are from uh, apo member countries uh, i mean across the asia and pacific many of them they are uh, policy makers or uh, industry representatives or sometimes uh, productivity practitioners that are supporting uh, businesses to go further uh, uh, in, in, in this productivity improvement journey. So I, I, I really appreciate your, uh, your sharing and these comprehensive yeah. views on policies, reactions, uh, implications. So uh, yeah. I have to thank you again uh, for this yeah, uh, presentation. Yeah, uh, that, can I add uh, one last point uh, before yes, I leave? The new normal uh, is not just resolving the current COVID-19 pandemic. The new normal is actually also preparing ourselves for the future pandemic effects uh, that will occur again and again. So uh, that preparation is very important for us, the structural transformation and how to make our cities and our workers more efficient, our SMEs efficient, is where the new normal will be. It's not just resolving the current pandemic, but actually preparing ourselves for future devastating effects of such pandemic. That's a, that's a very, very important point. Uh, I think people shouldn't take this as a one-off solution. Uh, it should be a learning process for us to know how we get to respond to similar uh, changes or shocks in the future, because it's not just a one-off thing. We may have different... Uh, uh, impacts in the future no matter like you said uh if it's the financial crisis asian uh, financial crisis like 20 years back or the uh, global financial shock that we experienced about 10 years ago so this 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 we, we should take it more of like a learning process and know how we get to improve and and enhance the resilience in the future so uh once again i hope to thank chandre uh for this wonderful sharing and your insights that's really really valuable uh, before we close uh, this P talk, do you have any other uh, message that you hope you would like to share to our audience um, for their reference, for their information, or something that you would like to add in the end? Uh, just uh, uh, the, uh, the only message I have is every shock uh, uh, creates uh, challenges and every shock also creates opportunities. And uh, the key element of SMEs uh, is uh, to enhance and take advantage of the opportunities that arise uh, in every shock. Uh, so there are ample opportunities that are arising from this uh, pandemic shock itself. 
the issue is uh, how to participate, how to uh, uh, create that environment uh, 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 to uh, take advantage of the opportunities. So uh, policymakers uh, need to respond uh, pretty fast to the, uh, the movement of people issue. And the private sector must respond uh, uh, strongly uh, in the public choice issues, and they need to participate. And that is the biggest lesson that uh, we can learn from the COVID-19 itself. Thank you. Uh, that's a very, very uh, uh, inspiring remark. I think uh, it's not just about challenges, but it's also learning opportunities for, for us to be, to be agile, to be uh, uh, reactive or, or even more uh, uh, prepared uh, for the future. So uh, thank you very much for today's sharing and the discussion. I really appreciate it. And I also uh, look forward to, I mean, in the future, uh, another opportunity to really see you in person uh, and to discuss together. So uh, I, once again, I encourage our audience to leave your uh, comments, uh, questions in, in the comment areas. We'll get back to you later. And also, I look forward to seeing you in person uh, somewhere sometime later when, uh, when the occasion is allowed. So please uh, you, stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you, Shandre. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. Stay safe, healthy too. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.